Good morning. Perfect wealth. And I love this picture. Because it so clearly states that money comes from within. Now, we don't find money in our bank accounts. We don't get it from our jobs. We don't get it from our retirement accounts or the government or our spouses. Money comes from within us. And that when we can open up and wrap our minds around the idea of prosperity, money will come shooting out into our lives. But this really doesn't have anything to do with my talk. I just love the picture. <laughs> so we're going to leave it up there just to anchor that in your subconscious mind while I'm speaking, that if you're looking for money, the only place you will find it is within yourself. And the only way you can create it is from the inside out, not from the outside in. Have you ever noticed that when you go looking for money, you may find some, but you don't keep it? Then you gotta go look it again. But when we learn how to create it, Eric's taking a picture of the screen. When we learn how to create it, it's an ongoing flow in our lives. But what I want to talk about today is wealth, perfect wealth. And we're on a bit of a, a series here. Last week was perfect health, and this week is perfect wealth, and in two weeks it'll be perfect happiness. And that comes from uh, Joseph Murphy's work as a divine science minister of, of, he wrote a book called Perfect Health, Perfect Wealth, and Perfect Happiness, and it's part of our Committing to Prosper program affirmation in our Monday night class. It's, it, we say, I know that true prosperity includes perfect health, perfect wealth, and perfect happiness. So since we're rattling that out a couple hundred times a day, I thought we would look at what the perfect wealth might be. And wealth is a great quantity or store of money or valuable possessions, property, or other <coughs> riches. Something that has value. Wealth is a great quantity of it. It's an abundance or profusion of anything, a plentiful amount. Anything that has utility and is capable of being appropriated or exchanged, rich or valuable contents. The state of being rich, prosperity, affluence, all of this is wealth. And what I keep remembering is that wealth includes money, but really wealth is so much greater than any amount of money that we could count or have or deposit or invest. That wealth is something greater. And so when we look at true prosperity, including perfect health, perfect wealth, and perfect happiness, this idea of wealth is more about our life experience than it is what we've got in the bank. I know that there are people that have a lot in the bank and they are not wealthy. And when John and I were working uh, with an organization called End World Hunger and putting vegetable gardens in the low-income housing developments across the country, there were people who didn't have two cents and they were wealthy. They were wealthy and they gave and they had community and they had great love and they had a rich experience in their life. They had wealth. You can have a wealth of knowledge. You can have a wealth of experience. You can have a wealth of, ex uh, of, of experience. I just said that. You can have wealth of all kinds of things other than what people so normally think of as stacks of gold. I do love gold. Stacks of $100 bills. I, I just, you know, that's my bill. That, that Ben Franklin, that's my bill, I like that. Stacks of whatever, people think that, that to be wealthy, they want that. And what happens is, you come to the Monday Night Prosperity class, we teach you how to create money, and then you get the money and most people go, huh, it didn't really do what I thought it would do. I now have nicer things. I have a new car, I have a new house, I have a new spouse, I have a new experience, but I'm still me. So going and getting that which we think is going to make us feel wealthy doesn't really work. It's a, it's a, it's a fine experience and I think that everyone should have it. And then you'll have plenty of money and you'll be able to move on after that. But this idea of wealth is a richer and fuller experience and sometimes you have wealth in ways that money doesn't come into contact. You know, we teach in the science of mind that everything comes from within and is manifested on the outside. 
And um, Joseph Murphy, who was a student of Emmett Fox, who was a, a divine science minister and wrote the book Sermon on the Mount that is used in so many 12-step programs. 12-step programs and science of mind have been holding hands ever since uh, Bill Wilson and Ernest Holmes swapped books. And, and this, this idea that says there is a power in your subconscious mind, which was one of Joseph Murphy's books, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind, talks about changing your consciousness to change your experience. You know, you can think a thought and change your life. Excellent. You just can't think any other thought than that one thought. You have to think that one thought so perfectly that it is known and believed and experienced and, and embodied, and then that manifests out in your world. So one of the things that uh, Joseph, Mur uh, Joseph Murphy said was that wealth is simply a subconscious conviction on the part of the individual. Everybody take a deep breath. Some people are not going to like this next statement. Your attention now. You will not become a millionaire by saying, I am a millionaire. You will grow into a wealth consciousness by building into your mentality the idea of wealth and abundance. And some people come into this center and they come into this teaching and they say, Barbara, 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 give me an affirmation that I can say once because you know I got a lot of things to do that will have me win the lottery so that I can be happy. And I say no. And then sometimes they get mad and leave. Sometimes this takes months or years for this to happen. But what this teaching really says is that by changing your subconscious mind, by changing the way that you see the world, you can experience the life you want to live. However, if you are thinking in the way that created the life that you want out of, or the life that you want to change, simply by thinking one thought, you're not going to change that. You're not going to change it just by going, I'm a millionaire. Oh God, i got to go get gas, and I hope this clunker works, and oh, going to that dirty, rotten, rack and fragile place. No, we've got to change the whole subconscious mind. The way we see the world, the way we feel, what we believe, create a mental equivalent of a life that is prosperous and abundant, that we have an excess of. My, my uh, work internally lately has been that I have a wealth of time. I have an abundance of time. I have more than enough time. My affirmation is time expands to meet my every desire. Not my every need because I don't want to be working out of need. Time expands to meet my every desire. So what is it that you're creating? And then we've got to wrap our head around it and change deep down inside of us at the level that we don't even know we think. I often say a thought plus a feeling equals an action. That thought is creative. The truth is, is that there's something that happens before thought. That there's a belief system. That there's a knowing that happens before we think the thought that creates the experience. So what are we believing about wealth? I love the idea of wealth being passed down from generation to generation. A wealth that lasts for generations. Isn't that a wonderful idea? That's twisted a little bit in, in Bible quotes to being the negative side of that, which is the sins of the fathers are passed down for seven generations. Seven generations just being a number of perfect completion. I would rather think that our wealth, mm -hmm. our love, our joy is passed down for seven generations. And so what we want to do in this idea of perfect wealth is we want to expand our consciousness, expand our belief system, expand the way we see the world to be able to take the abundance out of it, the joy out of it, the beauty out of it, instead of descending down into the muck and mire of it. So I have a story for you. Sometimes wealth has nothing to do with money. Sometimes it is simply the individual and collective consciousness, the individual and collective subconscious of those involved. So a week ago Sunday, John was speaking in Bakersfield, California, and he worked with their board for a while, and then uh, Monday he got in his rental car and drove to the top of a mountain. It was a town called Idlewild, California. And on top of that mountain was a camp. It's called Camp 
buckhorn. And in that camp, I've gotten conflicting numbers. We had somewhere between 350 and 600 religious science teenagers. It was teen camp. John went to teen camp. And he said it was an amazing experience that he got there late in the day on Monday and they immediately put him on KP duty. His job was scraping the, the plates because, you know, teenagers, they eat a huge amount of food. And then you put three, four, five, six hundred of them together, there's a lot of food going on. So he's scraping plates and he said he had such a blast. The kids in the kitchen were just cutting up and they were having so much fun. And he got a cot to sleep in, a bed in one of the, the camp rooms and uh, got up the next morning and had the opportunity to um, participate in their pre-breakfast spiritual practice. They go all gather before breakfast. They gather in this giant room. And the particular one they were doing that day, they uh, had half the people close their eyes and stand there. And the other half would walk to each person and then move on and somehow caress them or hug them or whisper a word of encouragement in their ear. And he said by the time they were done, he was just crying. <laughs> he had to stand there and just take all of his love. And that night he had an opportunity to speak to the kids. And he said, look around the room. They say you're teenagers, but you are so much more. And he told them, look around the room, and in this room, there are doctors that will help people. There are people who will invent things that will change the way we live. Look around this room. In this room, there are practitioners and ministers that will be there with people during their breakthroughs in life. Look around this room. In this room, there are millionaires. And at that time, the room just went crazy. They were all about being the millionaires. Look around this room. There are mothers and fathers that will raise children in a whole new way. They say you're teenagers, and that is so far from the truth. So the room was going crazy, and John went to bed, and uh, got up the next morning, and there was this, this uh, smoke in the air. Just a lot of smoke in the air, and there was some word about evacuation, but they all knew they were safe and that everything was fine. And I talked to him a few times during the day, and, and he would tell me about this word, this evacuation, and that there were buses lined up outside and things like that. But they all knew that they were safe and that everything was fine. And Wednesday night, actually Tuesday, or Wednesday, Wednesday evening, at 10 o'clock hour time, some of you know I have a nine and a half month old, 75 pound Labrador retriever, a yellow lab. <laughs> Now, this is a, a bit of a strange dog because she doesn't bark. It's, it's very rare that she ever barks. She's just not a barker. <laughs> She's not a barker, but at 10 o'clock that night, she was trying to climb up on my lap, and she was this far away from me, barking and barking and barking and barking and barking. And barking. Finally, I said, oh, you have to go out. And I took her out, and she didn't need to go, so I put her in the basement crate, shut the doors, stop it. And then at 3 o'clock that morning, because I couldn't sleep, I flipped on Facebook, and I learned that Camp Buckhorn in Idlewild, California, had been evacuated at 7 o'clock their time, which is 10 o'clock our time. And when the orders for evacuation came in, there was no discussion. The, the police were there, and they were told they had to leave, and they were told to get their, their wallets and their cell phones so that they could call their parents, and that's about all they could take. And, and they, they were in school buses, so there was no room to take their suitcases or anything like that. So they, they jumped in the buses, and John was there helping everybody get on the bus, and they took them to a town called Hemet, California, where the Red Cross was waiting in the gymnasium, and they had cots set up. There were three youth camps evacuated to this one gymnasium. The Red Cross was doing a great job at providing food and water, but there were not nearly enough cots. 
So the kids were stretched out on the bleachers and the floor, on the cots, and John looked around and said, I love you all, but I have a car, so I'm going to go get a room. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing was that the next day, you got hundreds of kids. Hundreds of kids in this gymnasium that are supposed to be at camp. They have activities planned for camp. And so the youth leader, Keith Cox, Reverend Keith, called the closest Science of Mind Center, Center for Spiritual Living Palm Desert, with Reverend Joe Hooper. And Joe said, come on, bring them. And so they, they organized buses, because they couldn't use the Hemet school buses to go to Palm Desert. They had to rent buses, and they came in a caravan of three giant coaches and 20 cars. Now by now, Keith Cox is a wreck. <laughs> He's had youth camp evacuated. He's got parents and kids and all of this stuff, and they're on a bus. And this is what we do. This is our wealth of consciousness. Joe Hooper is in the driveway as Keith gets out of the bus, and he throws his arms wide, and he says, Big Daddy's gotcha, Papa Bear. <laughs> <laughs> because the kids all call Keith Papa Bear. And Joe's out there going, Big Daddy's gotcha. And so they brought these hundreds of teens into a center not much bigger than this. And they had food and drink and ice and water. They resumed teen camp in the sanctuary. Joe's next door neighbor was a grocer and he organized for local groceries to deliver food when they found that all the kids were coming. Not only this, but Idlewild, California has been evacuated and their stuff is still at the camp. The owners of Camp Buckhorn rented two U-Hauls and drove back up into the fire area to gather up all of the kids' belongings not knowing if their camp was going to burn to the ground, they gathered up all the kids' belongings and brought them all the way to Palm Desert so the kids could have their clothes and their iPads and their whatever it is they carry off the camp, all of that stuff. For me, the organization of a group of people just like us, be just like coming to this center, was such a demonstration of wealth. Not necessarily a wealth of money, although it took money to rent the buses and it took money to, somebody had to pay for the food and, and get it delivered and have all the kids continue to have camp. A number of kids slept in the sanctuary. Some of them went off to members' houses to sleep in a bed and get a hot shower. It took a wealth of what? A wealth of love, a wealth of commitment, a wealth of community, and it took money, but money wasn't what it was about. We can have money stacked up, and it will not make us wealthy. This was such a demonstration to me of wealth, of being able to say, we stand together, we are here for each other, and we can do this. John ended up in Palm Springs, where he's speaking this morning, at a resort, with a big picture window, and what was the window looking at but Idlewild, California. And every day he would say, I see the flames, I see the smoke, I see the planes flying down, flying around 24 hours a day, dropping their no more burn stuff. <laughs> and this morning at three o'clock, he called me, six o'clock our time, to say, the rain woke me up. Oh, it's yeah. pouring here. <coughs> it's coming down in sheets and I don't see any more smoke. Now this is all, in my opinion, a manifestation of our subconscious mind as a collective, that we have what we need to do what we need to do, whether it's to invest in a business, whether it's to buy the property that we wanna buy, whether it's to move to where we want to move to, whatever it is that we have what we need, whether it's to gather three, four, five, six hundred kids together, and to take care of them. We have what we need in our collective consciousness. And I believe we have what we need 
to even make it rain in the desert. It's raining in the desert today. Yes. So what is perfect wealth? Perfect wealth is having what we need when we need it to do what we need to do. Perfect wealth is having what we want when we want it to do what we want to do. And that can include finances, but it certainly is not limited to that. And the way that we create perfect wealth in our lives is to change the way we see our world. That if something looks like it's going to be a problem, it turns into an adventure. If something looks like we're losing something, we know that that which is ours cannot be taken from us. And so there must be a pony in here somewhere. There must be a game in here somewhere. And we stay with that until we hold it in our hands. I would submit to you that every person in this room is wealthy. You may be working on money. That's okay. But you are wealthy. You are a wealthy, powerful, creative, spiritual being. When we start taking inventory of our assets, and we include love, and we include inspiration, and we include community, and we include opportunity, and we include uh, uh, education and knowing about life, <coughs> when we include our health and our friends, we can amass a great balance sheet that has our wealth listed sky high. Don't get hung up on the money. You can create money anytime you want just by wrapping your head around it. Look at your wealth. Be grateful for your wealth. And understand that where you stand today, you do not stand alone. You stand with hundreds and thousands and millions of other people who stand together in this world saying there is more than enough, <coughs> that we are blessed, and that life is good. And so it is. And so that's our point.